I'm Lisa Pettis, a Criminal Justice Senior Fellow with the Art Street Institute, and I'm speaking with Chief Jason Lando of the Frederick Police Department in Maryland about arrest alternatives being used in his community. My name is Jason Lando. I uh, became the Chief of Police in Frederick, Maryland in March of 2021. Uh, new to Maryland, uh, still getting to learn, learn the area a little bit, learn the people. Uh, but uh, prior to that, I spent 21 years <clears throat> with the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and I retired from there in February of 2021, with my last assignment being the commander of the Narcotics and Vice Division. But just prior to that, I spent five years leading one of the precincts, or in Pittsburgh, we call them zones, uh, where there was um, a pretty significant crime issue and mistrust between police and community. So I, come to, I came to my new position as chief in Frederick with some ideas and some initiatives in mind that I brought with me from Pittsburgh um, to kind of change that narrative and bring the police and the community closer together. Wonderful. So you brought some ideas with you. Uh, what kind of arrest alternatives are you using um, with the Frederick Police Department? So, uh, you know, in full transparency, uh, I don't take credit for a lot of this stuff. The, the Frederick Police Department has been doing the right things in policing for uh, a significant amount of time before my arrival. But there was one program that I felt really passionate about starting, uh, and that is the Crisis Car Program. Uh, and we, I, I know we'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, but there was another program already in place when I got to town. Um, it's a pilot program called LEAD, the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. One of our lieutenants, Lieutenant Corbett, is running that program right now. Uh, and then there's the JEDI program, which is like a lead program for, for youth and for juveniles. <clears throat> so I would say those are like three of the, the main programs uh, right now going on in Frederick, where we're trying to find um, alternatives to the traditional, uh, you know, use of police, where we're just, we're, we're going out and arresting people for crimes. We're trying to, um, you know, obviously there are times we know when we have to make arrests. And I just, I do want to be clear about that. Um, but there are also times I think where people are really struggling. They're in a tough place and putting the handcuffs on them uh, might not be the best solution. And we have to realize that when we do that, sometimes we change the trajectory of that person's life, uh, perhaps forever. And so looking at alternatives uh, in a couple different scenarios, I think is, is really important. So you mentioned Crisis Car, uh, car is one of the programs that you've helped start. Can you just dive into a little bit more about what exactly Crisis Car is, how it works? Sure. So the Crisis Car program is our mental health co-response program. And you're starting to see programs like this pop up all over the country. And some have been in place for, for quite a while. We're very lucky in policing. We can pick up the phone and call police departments anywhere around the country and say, hey, we heard you're doing this. And they'll gladly tell us you know, their success stories, what's working, what's not working. Um, so we have uh, chatted with some other police departments around the country in designing our program. Um, in Frederick, I think the one thing that's unique <clears throat> is our program uh, pairs three disciplines together. We have the Frederick Police Department, so we have a police officer on the car. We have an EMT or a paramedic, just depending on the day and the staffing uh, from our county fire rescue. And we have a mental health clinician from Shepherd Pratt, which is our local uh, provider of, one of our local providers of mental health services here in Frederick. And uh, when you look around the country, I think a lot of times you'll see the, sometimes the programs are mental health based, sometimes they're fire department based, sometimes the police aren't even in the equation. Um, I just, I felt really strongly here when we ran our pilot uh, that we keep the police uh, as part of the program for safety, reasons. And when you look at some of the calls we go out on, um, they're really ending in one of three ways, right? Either the person ultimately has a warrant for their arrest, or they are being violent, or they're, you know, committing a crime. So you need the police. Um, maybe it's a drug overdose, or it turns out to be a medical emergency uh, that, that we're getting called for, in which case we have an EMT or a paramedic on the car. And then, you know, more often than not, because primarily this car is being used for mental health crisis response, that person really needs to just talk to someone, right? They just, they need a therapist. They need someone who can de-escalate a situation and, and just talk to them about their mental health needs. So we thought pairing those three disciplines together on the car would allow that team to work cohesively uh, and collaboratively at, at solving those problems. Um, we know sometimes these calls can can completely vary, like from the way they're dispatched 
to what happens when they arrive on scene. Um, we know that there's no like cookie cutter model necessarily. So letting that team go out and problem solve together uh, and figure out who is the best person to take the lead in a given situation. And so that's kind of the model of the car. Um, right now, because of some staffing concerns, we run the car five days a week. Uh, at first, we were running it four hours a day. We've expanded it um, about six or seven months ago to eight hours a day. So the car is now 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday, uh, from 1 p.m. until 9 p.m. And we picked those times because we just looked at the times where it was most likely. What, what are the, the eight hours in a day where we're most likely to get called to a mental health emergency? And that appeared to be the best window of time. So and that's how we selected that. <clears throat> and, you know, you, you're talking a little bit about um, that you're getting these high volumes of call during that time. Was there an issue that you saw within the community that you were trying to specifically address with this model? Yeah, I mean, uh, I really believe that the majority of police officers every day are, they are good, ethical, law-abiding uh, people that want to go out and make a, a difference in their community. Um, when you turn on the TV and you see some of these really nasty incidents, these ugly uses of force that play out, um, you know, I think a lot of the times when you look at it, it's, it's not an officer with, with mal or bad intent or ill intent. It's an officer sometimes that's placed in a situation that they're probably not the best person to be dealing with that. A lot of these issues that we're seeing are people that are, they're, they ha they're having some sort of mental health emergency. And maybe that manifests in them, um, you know, acting out, being violent, not obeying orders or not obeying commands. Um, and so really this came from uh, a desire to keep my cops safer and keep our community safer. Uh, if we can end a, an encounter by having a therapist talk to somebody and de-escalate rather than an officer who has not received that same level of training in mental health emergencies, um, and we can actually bring a, a mental health professional with us to calls uh, and we can provide the care they need and that keeps that officer from using force, or keeps that officer from getting injured by having to fight with someone. That's a win-win for everybody. The, the person that we're called to care for is, is safe and the officer is safe as well. Uh, and so really that's where the desire came from was to end these situations in a safer way for everybody. So those are some of the benefits. What else have you seen? What have been the positives coming from this program? And has public safety, in fact, been increased? You had indicated that was maybe a motivator, but has that actually proven to be true? Yeah, so uh, I can tell you just anecdotally, you know, I have the police radio in my office and I hear that the car is being dispatched uh, every day on calls. So they're being used and that's good. Um, so uh, the community you know, the community loves this program, just knowing that it's out there. Um, whenever we talk about it publicly, there's been news stories on it. Um, the community is so appreciative that we are being progressive and forward thinking in how we deal with these things. I mean, that right there is, is, a, is a big win. Um, you know, we talk about, um, you know, the, the community bank account, you know, every day making deposits in that bank account or withdrawals. Um, just having the program in place in Frederick has been a huge deposit in the community bank because uh, I think our residents know like, hey, the Frederick police are trying to, they're thinking outside the box. They're trying to do something differently to creatively solve problems, and they appreciate that. And then the other benefit, um, you know, we, we every month we do, a, we run a report to just to see, like, how, how the progress is going on the car. And I know that in the one year that the, uh, well, I should say the first year um, that the program was in place, we used force one time. And that was not a significant use of force. Uh, we report a lot of uh, a lot of things that some departments don't report, and so this was a very low level of, of force that was used in one incident that some police departments wouldn't even consider a use of force. It was a come along hold where we had to, I guess, kind of like pull someone uh, into or out of a vehicle. Um, and so that tells me that when that car is in operation, the uh, team that's working on the car is approaching things from the right frame of mind. They are de-escalating situations and they're not resulting to, to using force. Um, conversely, when we're sending police uh, and uh, mental health providers separately to calls, my concern is that you don't have that team cohesion, right? Like they're, you're going to get 
a random officer who's assigned to that call and a random um, uh, therapist or a random provider who's assigned to the call. They're not arriving at the same time. So what happens if the officer gets there and uh, if, if a therapist was the first person to arrive, perhaps they could have kind of de-escalated uh, a little bit better, but instead the officer ends up using force uh, or Conversely, what if the, the mental health provider gets there first and the individual is violent and there's no officer there? Uh, and so having a team arrive together, I think, has been a, a, a huge benefit in kind of quelling those situations. And it sounds like anecdotally, you've definitely seen some benefits and are working to further support those with the data and statistics. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I said, I think um, you know, a lot of times we get an idea in our head, uh, you know, I, and I do, I, you know, people make fun of me all the time. I, I say, hey, this is a great idea. Like, let's implement it. And then a month later, we're like, yeah, okay, maybe that wasn't the best idea. And so I think the, the constant reevaluation is important. I can tell you the program uh, itself is here to stay. I mean, it's, there is a need for it in the community. We have a significant number of mental health calls. Um, but maybe the way we run the program will change or maybe um, the hours or the days or the providers on the car um, just based on what we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis out in the street. And that's we just need to keep an open mind that just because we come up with an idea doesn't mean that it has to be that thing forever and ever. You started to hit a little bit on that there have, in fact, been challenges. And I think <clears> it's really important for um, others to hear what some of those challenges are and how you've tried to work through them. So can you explain some of those challenges and, and what you've done to overcome them? Staffing. Staffing is an issue, I think, in probably every public safety agency in the country right now. Uh, and so the idea for us is to have a set team of providers on the car so you have that team cohesion. When they come to work every day, it's, oh, you know, hey, Jason and LaSalle are working together today. We know each other. We know how we operate. Like, we don't need to, when we get to a scene, we already know what the other person's thinking. Well, because of staffing issues currently, we have a grant, and we are staffing um, our role on the car with overtime. And I know the fire department is as well. And so that means that officers are signing up for four-hour blocks at a time. So in uh, five days a week, eight hours a day so that we have, you know, these uh, four hour blocks, uh, an officer will sign up for the first four hours, another officer will sign up for the next four hours. Same thing with the firefighters. We don't know what clinician on a given day will be assigned to the car because they rotate through because they have other duties. So every shift, you could potentially have a different lineup of people working the car. And so that is, um, and I don't wanna say it's created like major issues, but it has created some issues where, um, and part of the reason why we're doing the training is the team gets to, to the, the call and they're like, okay, I don't, I don't know how you work and I don't know how you work. And so who's going to take lead on this today? And, you know, uh, Hey, why are you, why are you, why are you handcuffing that person? Like I wouldn't handcuff that person, uh, cause we've never worked together before. Maybe that officer is seeing something that you, you didn't see because you don't work well, you, you haven't worked together, um, you know, you're just not used to the way the other person does things. And so that can create some, I say the word conflict, that, you know, maybe that's too harsh of a word, but that can create, you know, some, some issues and some concerns. So <clears throat> long-term goal, when we get up to full staffing and we anticipate being at full staffing um, right around the spring of 2023, we uh, intend on taking two police officers uh, from patrol and assigning them full-time to our special operations division. And those two officers would be assigned to the crisis car as the permanent officers. Um, we are hoping that uh, fire rescue is able to do the same. Uh, right now, one of the other issues is the utilization of the EMT or the paramedic on the car. Um, they find that the EMT or paramedic isn't being used uh, really like enough to justify a full-time position on the car. Then the program might, the way the program looks might be different. Um, and so that's why we're doing that constant evaluation. And then the other thing I, which I already touched on is, is just that team cohesion, setting really clear boundaries. When you're on a call, if this is what you're presented with, this is who takes the lead. Um, you know, if the person is in any way being violent um, and violent to the point where um, having a therapist try to talk to them, uh, it's not working, then uh, the police officer has to take the lead. We have to make sure our team on the car is safe 
we uh, we don't want to have to use force. We don't want to have to make arrests, but we can't compromise the safety of our civilian providers on the car. Uh, and so part of the training we're going to be doing coming up is, um, you know, talking about when you arrive at a call based on what you're presented with, that will kind of dictate who the lead is on the car um, in that given scenario. So really just, uh, I call them growing pains. You know, like when you start a new program and, and you bring in three different agencies and they're all sitting in a car together every day going out answering calls, that is a new thing for policing. Um, and I would say that's probably also a new thing for our two partners as well. And just making sure that um, we have clear roles and boundaries. That's great. Um, so if, let's say there's some law enforcement agencies that get to watch this. They think this sounds amazing. We want to do the same. We want to mm -hmm. implement a, a like program. What advice would you give them to get that started? Okay. So my, uh, in keeping with my very type A personality, first of all, just do it. Like stop talking about it and just put something together um, and get that car out on the street. Uh, I know that sounds a little bit crazy, but I know of agencies, and I certainly won't name names, that have said to me uh, when they saw some of the articles that were printed, like, how did this get up and running so quick? Uh, and I said, I, I called the fire chief and I called our folks at Shepherd Pratt and I said, hey, like, we have a need for this here. Let's implement it. Let's get it out on the street like a couple hours a day and let's start to work through it. Um, I think in policing and, and government, public safety in general, we overanalyze things to death. Uh, and to the point where sometimes we don't even get a program off the ground. So I would say just, you know, reach out to your, your local uh, agencies, um, your, you know, your fire EMS provider, your mental health provider, and, and get something together and get it off the ground, start uh, doing training, start um, kind of analyzing the results, and you can tweak the program as you go. Um, you know, one of the things that we found, um, you know, for instance, I would not recommend you don't use a marked police car and don't have your officers in uniform. I mean, that is right there, right off the bat. That's one uh, learning thing I think, you know, for us is when you pull up at the scene of a mental health emergency, uh, the last thing that you want to do is put that person uh, on edge by showing up in a marked police car uh, with, with a, um, uh, you know, an officer with their, you know, their external vest carrier. And, you know, some people are very intimidated by that, especially someone who's in a mental health crisis. So um, we use an unmarked vehicle, um, preferably officers that are not in uniform. One of the struggles we face right now is it's an overtime detail. Uh, and sometimes officers are pulled right out of patrol to go out on the street in the car. So sometimes they are still in uniform. Um, but that's, you know, that's one of the things. Uh, try to avoid that if you can. Um, remember this car is a de-escalation tool. So anything you can do to kind of soften your approach is important. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think my biggest piece of advice would be, um, don't overanalyze it and just get the team out there, uh, and they will start to make a difference. I think that's a great statement to end on. So thank you so much for your time today, Chief. Uh, we hope this is helpful for whoever's listening. Please do not hesitate to reach out to Arshi if you'd like to learn uh, more about alternatives to arrest and get in touch with some of the chiefs doing amazing work like this. Thank Thanks you. so much for having me.